All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to today's lecture for Geography 101. Today we're going to be talking all about extreme weather phenomena. So anything from hurricanes, tornadoes, heat waves, anything that's uh, an extreme event in our atmosphere. Um, we'll talk about uh, the atmospheric conditions that, that form them and the, the effects that they can have. So in order to understand extreme weather events, first we have to understand fronts. So I've talked about fronts uh, earlier on in the class, but we'll go into a little bit more detail. So fronts are just a boundary between two air masses. Uh, and there are four different types of fronts. There's cold fronts where a cold air mass is advancing towards a warm air mass forcing it upwards. Uh, there's a warm front where there's a, a warm air mass that's advancing um, on top of a cold air mass that's stagnant. There's a stationary front on which there's no movement and the cold and warm air masses are just kind of sitting next to each other. Um, and then there's an occluded front in which um, two air masses have collided with the, uh, each other um, and have forced a warm air mass um, upwards uh, and out, out of the way. And so to go into a little bit more detail, uh, the cold fronts are indicated by the, this blue line um, with blue tri half triangles um, here on a, a standard weathered map um, and so, so it's a cold air mass that's moving towards a warm air mass and so as that happens you have adiabatic uh, lifting and, and cooling and the formation of cumulonimbus or thunderclouds often and so cold fronts are often associated with very heavy rainfall and they tend to be fairly fast. Cold fronts tend to move faster than warm fronts do. Um, a warm front is, as I said, um, a warm air mass moving over a cold air mass. And generally it has a much shallower slope than a cold front. And so you have a more gradient in that cloud formation instead of the formation of uh, cumulonimbus clouds, you kind of have this gradient from nimbostratus to altostratus, cirrus stratus, and up to cirrus clouds. Um, and because of that, you don't have as intense rainfall, and it tends to be just kind of um, moderate rainfall associated with uh, warm fronts. And we indicate that with a red line with half circles uh, on a weather map. An occlusion um, is when uh, two air masses collide and they force up a warm air mass. Um, and we indicate that with a, a purple line with both triangles and half circles. Um, and it generally tends to be a, a very narrow band of heavy rainfall um, as that warm air mass rises in a relatively small area compared to a cold or a, a warm front. So um, these fronts can form thunderstorms. And so, um, as I said, the cold front um, forces warm air upwards, and that's how you get that um, uh, traditional anvil-shaped cloud that we've talked about in the past. Um, but I want to talk about this a little bit more so that we can go into the phenomena of thunder and lightning itself. Um, so lightning can be extremely destructive um, and have big effects. So uh, lightning is only two to three centimeters across, um, but it can move at 17% of the speed of light and it can be five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So pretty much anything it touches completely in, uh, incinerates. Um, so 90% of the energy that goes into forming lightning uh, is released as heat. It's very um, hot ionized gas. 
and so um, it disperses a lot of heat. Um, and then 9% of that energy goes into the light EC, um, and then that one remaining percent of that energy goes into making the sound of, of thunder in that large boom. Um, thunderstorms can happen anywhere, but they're most common in areas with warm, wet um, atmospheric conditions. So you can see here that the most common location for thunderstorms is the state of Florida. Um, and you have some areas in the Midwest that also have frequent thunderstorms, but um, Florida tends to be um, kind of a, a perfect condition for thunderstorm formation. So what actually causes lightning? And hopefully I can explain to you um, how this electrical charge actually builds up. So in a thunderstorm, you have um, air rising um, and it starts to form snowflakes. Snowflakes are very spiky and have a lot of edges to them. And those edges are really good for building up electrons. Electrons really like to be um, to build up on corners uh, of a surface and snowflakes have a lot of them. Um, and so as those snowflakes rise due to those updrafts, um, they often can encounter uh, water droplets that are in hail that's falling downwards. And so as um, those snowflakes collide with the hail, um, it transfers those electrons to the hail um, as, uh, as it collides, um, those electrons that were built up on the surface. And so the electrons get can, uh, transferred to the hail and the neg it gains a negative charge as it moves down. And because it's lose the snowflakes are losing a negative charge, they become positively charged. Um, and so what happens is that you have positively charged snow moving upwards and negatively charged hail moving downwards. And so you have this separation of charges with negative charge at the bottom of the cloud and positive charge at the top of the cloud. Then because you have a very strong negative charge at the bottom of the cloud, um, what happens is that you have an induced current um, on the surface of the earth. And so um, that negative charge causes the surface to have um, a charge as well. And um, when that charge gets so large, um, it can eventually overcome the fact that air is a very bad electrical conductor. Um, and eventually it's able to ionize the air itself um, and equalize that charge difference, um, that positive charge on the surface and the negative charge at the bottom of the cloud. Um, and so what happens is that you have what's called um, a, a leader, um, which is the strand of the lightning that's coming down from the cloud that meets up with a streamer which is the strand of the lightning that moves upwards from the ground. And eventually those meet, and once they do, it's officially lightning. And you have that, um, those charged electrons throwing, uh, flowing through that path. Um, I know that was a, a lot um, to go over um, pretty quickly, but uh, it's pretty cool um, phenomena um, that can cause some pretty dramatic um, things in our atmosphere. Um, besides just normal lightning, there's a lot of uh, really cool rare lightning events that happen as well um, that are just kind of really fascinating phenomena, one of them being thunder snow. So as um, you remember I said that most lightning and thunderstorms happen in warm, wet environments. Um, but they can still, um, albeit less frequently, happen 
in cold environments where you have predominantly snow. Uh, and because snow has such a high albedo, um, or it's so reflective, um, the result of the lightning is that the entire sun or sky um, and the ground lights up and it can be a really um, beautiful phenomenon because it's just, just so bright. Another interesting phenomena is ball lightning. Uh, and this is a really baffling concept and we don't really know how it forms. But a lot of scientists um, hypothesize that um, as you have this induced charge build up on the surface, you can actually ionize some of the silica that's in the soil or in a window pane or just on the, the surface. Um, and that ionized silica can uh, form a, a ball of lightning that can actually stay there for several seconds. And it can be um, pea-sized all the way up to several meters across, as you can see here. Another interesting phenomena is red sprites. Um, so red sprites are a type of lightning that form extremely high up in the atmosphere, uh, in the ionosphere or a little lower than that. Um, and they form these, these beautiful um, red tendrils um, that can also sometimes have a jellyfish appearance to them. And they're, they occur over um, thunder, thunder clouds. And so while they're um, real, not that rare, um, they're very hard to see um, if you're not taking a picture from space just because the thunder cloud is, is covering up them up from view. And they form as nitrogen in the upper atmosphere actually gets ionized due to um, the induced charge from the top of the thunder thundercloud itself as well. Um, so that's another cool phenomena. And the last one we'll talk about are blue jets, which is a, a jet of electrically charged um, uh, particles that, that move through and, um, up from the surface and upwards at very high velocity uh, and can be several kilometers tall from the surface up through the through the thundercloud and that's also caused by ionization mainly of of nitrogen but also of some other gases and it um, can form these beautiful structures you see here so that's that's lightning uh, and some cool lightning structures as well uh, next, we'll talk about tornadoes. So tornadoes are also associated with thunderstorms. And so um, as a thunderstorm starts to form, you can all, uh, often have uh, vortices forming. So as wind um, flows quickly over the surface of the earth, it experiences shearing um, and that uh, friction causes the top of the airflow to move faster than the bottom of it and that causes a rotation around. Then the updrafts that are associated with thunderstorms um, because of that warm um, air mass being lifted up by the cold air mass, um, it lifts that uh, vortex up um, and then it continues to spin around um, the edge of the thunderstorm causing a, a tornado. Um, so tornadoes ha happen most frequently in the Midwest, especially in uh, uh, Texas and Nebraska areas and, and here. Um, and they're most common um, in um, early summertime. Uh, and so this, this area is, is often called Tornado Alley because you have a, a lot of strong winds that develop um, as the wind flows over the Rocky Mountains down into the plains and it has the space to form these, these vortices here. So um, they tend to be most frequent um, here and, and during that time of the year. Uh, we can 
categorize tornadoes um, based off of the uh, wind speeds that are associated with them. And the scale that we do that is called the enhanced Vegeta scale. And it goes from zero to five um, with tornadoes that are fairly low speed, um, 65 to 85 miles per hour, um, a zero, and then uh, wind speeds over 200 miles per hour, a uh, EF scale of, of five. And those can cause incredible amounts of, of damage. You may have seen pictures of uh, cows being lifted up and houses being destroyed and entire trees being lifted out of their roots. And so usually those occur in um, EF5 events. And um, there's one of the reasons why you have um, around 65 deaths per year in the U.S. from hurricanes and over 15,000 injuries. All right, um, and so next we'll talk about cyclones. Um, we already talked about cyclones in the previous class, um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit more um, about how they're related to hurricanes specifically. Um, and so you may remember that cyclones form due to a low pressure system um, with counterclockwise rotating air in the northern hemisphere, at least. Um, and these cyclones tend to be steered around by the jet stream as they get sucked into them. And some of them can be extremely large, um, over a thousand miles across. Um, so in terms of how these relate to um, fronts, um, cyclones generally have uh, two different fronts associated with them. So as this um, air rotates around, you have a warm front that is generally followed by a cold front. Uh, and also, um, you have a anti-cyclone, um, a high pressure system that generally follows this low pressure system as it moves across the landscape. Um, and so while the saying might be that, um, that there's a calm before the storm, there's also usually a calm after the storm as this anti-cyclone brings warm weather after the cyclone passes. So um, there are a number of different steps to how a cyclone actually starts off um, and then um, forms into a full-blown cyclone. The first of those steps is called cyclogenesis, and that's when you have a cold air mass and a warm air mass shearing past each other, um, and they're, they're moving uh, relative to each other. Um, the next step is called wave development, and that's when the um, boundary between the, the warm and air mass starts to get wavy. Um, and the warm air mass and the cold air mass start to rotate. Um, if it was in the northern hemisphere, that, that rotation would be counterclockwise. Um, and you can see that, um, that happening here. The next step is uh, frontal chasing. So um, now we've fully formed the, um, the warm front as well as the cold front as the, this boundary gets um, even more wavy. And so you have a, the warm air mass circulating onto the cold air mass and then that cold air mass pushing up on uh, the warm air mass. And uh, remember, cold air masses are generally faster than warm, warm fronts, and so um, the, this cold front will uh, start to outpace and catch up to this, this warm uh, front. The next step, then, is occlusion. Um, so you start to have this warm the cold front um, catching up to the the warm front and pushing air on top of the cold air mass so now you have uh, occluded the, the warm front because it's now on partially 
on top of the cold air mass. And then the um, next step is that the occlusion takes over the system and is the predominant um, feature uh, that, I, that you can see. And so uh, the majority of that warm air mass is now on top and being pushed upwards um, over the, the cold air mass. And that forms a lot of, of clouds um, and heavy precipitation. And then lastly, when the warm air mass is completely on top of the cold air mass, um, you move into dissipation um, because um, there's no longer um, that, that density difference um, driving the, the movement of these, these air masses. The, the weather system has gone into equilibrium and so the clouds can begin to clear. So um, hurricanes, as I've said, uh, are just particularly strong cyclone formations. Um, they're generally cyclones that um, always form over the ocean and they form over very warm water. So water that's over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And they need those warm waters to um, form that low pressure system. Uh, so uh, just like any um, cyclone, it has a center that's a low pressure system. Uh, and that low pressure system draws in air from the surface and pushes it upwards. And it generally forms these kind of um, concentric rings of, of weather as you have upwards and downward movement of air. Um, the hurricane fuels itself using latent heat release. Remember, we talked about um, latent heat and how when um, water vapor condenses, it releases the latent heat of uh, fusion. Um, or, or the, um, and so that um, heat released as the water is condensed fuels even stronger winds. And so um, if you have enough moisture, this can be kind of a self-replicating system and the wind speeds get stronger and stronger because of that latent heat release. Um, so most hurricanes happen between August and October as uh, the most common um, time of the year for them to occur, just because the ocean tends to be warmest during during that that time of the year um, and so um, storms can take a number of different tracks generally they move um, from east to west but um, on the eastern seaboard here there they usually follow the gulf stream uh, and move from western africa up the gulf and sometimes reach all the way up into the North Atlantic. We can classify the strength of a hurricane um, or cyclones that are weaker than hurricanes. So uh, cyclones that have wind speeds that are less than 38 miles per hour are classified as tropical depressions. Uh, and then uh, cyclones that are between 38 and 74 miles per hour are tropical storms. Um, and that's just a classification based off their wind speed. Uh, and then over 74 miles per hour, we use the uh, Saphir-Simpson scale in order to classify them from one to five. You may have heard of a, a category five hurricane being particularly strong. Um, and those are hurricanes that have wind speeds over 155 miles per hour and that is due to the fact that they have a very low pressure at their center um, around less than 920 millibars compared to um, over 980 for a uh, category one or, or a tropical storm uh, and you can see here this is the graph of the 
intense average intensity or power of hurricanes um, in the North Atlantic over time. And from both the satellite um, data as well as uh, climate models, we can see that that intensity is steadily increasing um, with a high amount of um, uh, dispersion. Um, but that, in, that power increase is due to the fact that climate change has caused um, oceans to warm and therefore hurricanes to have more strength uh, and, and blow harder. So also um, hurricanes are associated with storm surge. So storm surge is just an increase in the sea level temporarily due to uh, high winds and low, the low pressure system causing the water level to rise. And they are often the most destructive part of a storm because they cause extensive flooding uh, all throughout the, the coastline. So about 95% of storm surge is just caused by wind as really strong winds um, blow into the coast. Um, it pushes that water um, towards the coastline. And that is enough to um, significantly increase the water level as that, that water is, is pushed into shore. Um, the remaining 5% is due to that low pressure system itself. Um, the lower atmospheric pressure will actually pull up on the ocean and cause the water level to rise. Uh, and it's important to realize too that storm surge is on top of the tides and anthrop anthropogenic sea level rise. And so um, the higher the tide is and the more sea level rise that occurs due to climate change, the more impactful storm surge can be. And that's really seen well here. Um, we have a graph showing the water height um, of all of the major storms between 1950 and, and 2012 um, in Manhattan. Uh, and we can see that the total water level experienced was a combination of the tides in gray, uh, the sea level rise um, in dark blue, and the storm surge itself. Um, in light blue here, with Sandy being um, the most amount of flooding um, in recent history that flooded the New York subway system. Um, but you can see here as well that um, the, these blue bars are steadily increasing as sea level continues to rise. And so sea level in um, New York, New Jersey area is expected to rise around three feet um, and by 2050, um, or um, two to three feet by 2050. Um, and so um, you can see that all of these bars, um, if they continue to happen like this, um, are going to just be shifted up by another two feet. So um, a lot of these bars stop, start to um, reach this limit where the New York subway system starts to get flooded um, on top of the fact that storm surges are likely to get um, even worse as well um, as uh, hurricanes get, become even more powerful. So we are expecting to have um, much more damaging and impactful uh, hurricanes in the future. All right, and the last thing that we're going to be talking about today are heat waves. And so heat waves um, can be defined as uh, a number of different things. But generally, uh, if you ask a climate scientist, a uh, heat wave is just a period of time with exceptionally high temperature um, and usually high humidity as well. Uh, and these can be very dangerous because they uh, can cause crops to die off, they decrease the soil moisture, um, they can cause heat stroke and even death. Um, 
and they're generally formed um, due to a persistent high pressure system, that anti-cyclonic um, atmospheric condition. And you can see here in this, these maps and these graphs that um, the number of days that are considered heat waves has been steadily rising in U.S. cities. Um, and the length of the heat wave um, season has also been rising, in some instances more than two months in length. Um, so this is really significant. And this, of course, is, is due to climate change as well. And we can see that more clearly um, here. So um, this is a map that shows um, the number of days that had deadly um, heat waves in 1950. Uh, and a deadly heat wave is just any um, heat wave that was right of this red line here um, when we plot um, average daily temperature and average daily humidity. So a, a deadly heat wave has to be exceptionally hot and exceptionally high humidity. And yellow is um, generally uh, around 50 um, days per year where you can potentially have um, deadly heat wave events. And this is our, our current situation right now. Um, there's definitely an increase in the number of uh, days that have deadly heat waves. Um, and that those increases are seen especially in Brazil um, and in Asia, but you can also see that now uh, the southern United States also has deadly heat waves. If we continue with climate models to project um, how heat waves will continue in the future due to climate change, we can see this. And so um, these are the different uh, climate scenarios. We call these RCPs, uh, uh, representative uh, climate pathways, uh, concentration pathways. Um, and so a RCP 2.6 is if we rapidly address climate change and reduce our emissions. RCP 4.5 is if we slowly reduce our emissions. And then RCP 8.5 is if we do nothing and just continue emitting carbon dioxide. And you can see here that there's a really significant increase in the um, number of, of deadly heat days. Um, for these more intense um, climate scenarios. And these trends um, become even more significant um, as we move to 2100, um, with more than half of South America experiencing um, deadly heat waves for over um, half the year, um, and also um, Central Africa having really um, uh, crazy hot days, uh, as well as m most of um, the eastern United States. We can zoom into New Jersey to get a, a clearer picture of what uh, we might experience here. Um, and so uh, under RCP 2.6, that's the um, rapidly addressing climate change, we would expect that the number of deadly heat days to be fairly low, um, less than a, a week per year. Um, whereas um, in a bit the business as usual scenario, we would have over two and a half months out of the year where you have um, deaths associated with the, the number of uh, the, the heat and humidity going on. So that's just some of the um, extreme weather phenomena that can occur in our atmosphere, and give you a better understanding of um, the different phenomena that can occur and how those can be ramped up. So in summary, we talked today about um, fronts uh, in that atmospheric phenomena. We talked about how those fronts form thunderstorms and the tornadoes that are associated with them. We talked about that cyclone formation process. 
Um, we also talked about hurricanes and their associated storm surge. And then lastly, we talked about heat waves and um, how they're related to climate change. All right. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next class.